Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this RoboLaunch session. Uh, this week in a two-part series with two two robotics that work in field robotics from Latin America. And the first one is Gustavo Freitas, professor at the, the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. Gustavo is a professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, and his research focuses on field robotics and mainly on its applications to environmental, mon envir environmental monitoring, agriculture, mining, and oil and gas production systems, with close collaborations with the Petrobras, Petrobras Robotics Laboratory and the Instituto Tecnológico Vale, the Vale Technological Institute of Robotics in Brazil. He received his bachelor's degree in control and automation engineering from the Federal University of Santa Catarina and his master's and doctorate degrees in control, automation, and robotics from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, both in Brazil, during which uh, his doctoral degree, during which he spent one year at Carnegie Mellon University as a visiting researcher with Professor Marcel Bergman and Sanjeev Singh. So, without further ado, please, Gustavo, uh, the floor is yours. Well, so hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Well, here in Brazil, it's afternoon already. So, thanks, uh, Liu, for the nice introduction. And thanks for the invitation uh, for this talk at the Robot Lounge. Today, I'm going to talk about mining and robotics and uh, tell you some research initiatives at Vale. So this is the summary of this presentation. I will start with a short biography. Then I'm going to talk about Vale and mining in Brazil. Then I'm going to present some robotic systems that are in operation in Brazil. Uh, then I go in Vale. Uh, next, I'm going to describe some research initiatives from Vale Institute of Technology. And finally, the conclusions of this talk. So beginning with a short biography, Leo already told something about myself. So I really started in the field robotics area in 2005, when I moved to Rio de Janeiro to work in the Petrobras, which is the big oil company in Brazil. And I was working in the robotics lab of Petrobras. As Leo said, in 2011, I did part of my PhD at Carnegie Mellon, working with professors Marcel Bergman and Sanjeev Singh. Then I came back to Brazil to finish my PhD at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, I finished my PhD in 2014 when I moved to Vale, which is the biggest mining company in Brazil. So I was working in the robotics lab of the Vale Institute of Technology until uh, 2014. And in 2014, I moved to the Federal University of Minas Gerais. I became a professor there, working in the research group Macro, which is Mechatronic Control and Robotics. And I'm still working a lot uh, with Vale and Petrobras, as I'm going to show you today. So here are some robots that I have been working in these years. Here at the top uh, right, you can see the environmental uh, hybrid robot. Uh, this robot was developed by Petrobras to do environmental monitoring in the Amazon rainforests in regions closer to areas of oil and gas exploration. Uh, the second robot here that you see is called Diane or uh, Gianni. We developed this robot for the World Cup in Brazil in 2014. This robot is capable to climb stair, uh, stairs and zarn bombs. Here, this other robot was also developed for the oil company in Brazil, Petrobras. And it's a mobile robot that moves in a rail. And the idea is to install the system in offshore platforms to do automatic inspections of these uh, production plants. Here at the left, we see a picture of the X-Squad team. It was a team that we started to compete uh, in an autonomous drone race competition in 2019. This competition was organized by DRL, which is the Drone Race League, together with Lockheed Martin. And here at the bottom, we can see a robot that I worked at, at Carnegie Mellon in 2011. It's autonomous robots uh, that navigates in orchards, uh, apple orchards. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about Vale and mining in Brazil. Vale is a global mining company headquartered in Brazil. It's one of the biggest mining companies around the globe. It's a world production leader in iron ore, iron pellets, and nickel. Vale also produces copper, coal, fertilizers, manganese, ferro alloys, cobalt, and platinum group metals. And as you see, the company invests a lot in logistics, steel industry, and energy. Uh, the company was uh, created in 1942, and the operations were, were initially concentrated in Minas Gerais, which is countryside of Brazil. In its first year, Vale produced 40,000 metric tons of iron ore, which is the same amount it now ships out every hour. Uh, the company was privatized in 1997. At that time, the market value of Vale was around $2.5 billion, with some net earnings around $350 million. Uh, in 2019, the market value of the company was around $300 billion, with a net earning about $660 million. And for you to have an idea, Vale today has around 200,000 employers and contractors. So it's a really big company. Uh, so this is an overlook of the operations of Vale in 2015. Uh, in addition to the headquarter in Rio de Janeiro, Vale has operations, research labs, projects, and offices on five continents all around the globe. And as I'm going to show you, Vale is much more than just mining. Uh, Vale is operating in the entire uh, chain production. So it's uh, that uh, involves mine, plant, expedition, railroad, and port. So the activities related to mining, Vale is committed to maintaining the leadership position in the global iron ore market by increasing the production capacity in line with growing demand, controlling costs, and strengthening its railway and port infrastructure. Logistics. Vale invests more in logistics in Brazil than any other company uh, here in the country. To ensure safe, fast transportation of minerals, Vale has an integrated logistics network encompassing mines, railways, ships, and ports. The company has its own infrastructure. It transports cargo for third parts and runs the two main passenger train services in Brazil. Uh, talking about energy, which is a fundamental input uh, for the sustainability of the activities. So Vale researches and invests in renewable energy sources, such as biodiesel, hydroelectric plants, and wind power. The company is also developing technologies to reduce energy consumption in the operations. Well, after talking a little bit about Vale and introducing you the company, I'm going now to present the robotic systems that are currently in operation in the company. So what are the motivations and the challenges here? The idea is to use robots in repetitive, non-ergonomic and risky tasks. Uh, other possibilities to use these robots in harsh environmental conditions and isolated and difficult access areas. And the idea here is to use these robots to solve some problems, including the lack of local highly qualified human resources, the high dependence on, uh, on third-party companies, which usually take long time to execute maintenance operations. So today, Vale has eight robotic systems in operation in four different cities all around Brazil, and I'm going to present you these systems in operation. So first, we have here the haulage truck washing system. It's installed in Carajás, in the north of Brazil, here we are using two big ABB robotic manipulators installed on tracks that operate side by side, uh, washing uh, the trucks, the haulage trucks, and other kinds of equipment. So with the system, Vale was able to reduce the operation time about two times. Also, we are saving water and some chemical products that are used during the washing pro uh, process. And before that, we had somebody that was holding a hug with high pressure water to do this task. And today we have the robotic system executing this one. And here you can see a video uh, where the equipment is washing different trucks and other kinds of equipment. 
Well, moving to the second system, this is one of the most complex systems in operation at Vali today. It's a robotic cell for melding wagon plates. So the idea is to fix this wagon as that can have some uh, some problems and shape problems. So first, the systems use uh, laser uh, equipment to model these wagons. Then we do some special cuttings on these steel plates. And then we put new plates in the place. And finally, we weld these new metal plates. Uh, and with that, we can recover uh, the wagons, as you'll see in the end. So here we have four robotic manipulators, also from ABB, uh, operating on tracks. Two of them are, are installed upside down, as you can see here in the video. And as you can see, there are a lot of steps to complete the process. It's a quite complicated process, which has been done autonomously today. And at the end, you can see the wagons repaired. Moving to, for the third uh, system, we have the pelletized mechanical workshop at Vitalia. So we have this robotic manipulator that's mounting grates in pelletizing cars. So usually we have to mount more than 100 grates on these pelletizing cars. This activity was done manually before. So these grates are heavy, they weigh uh, more than seven kilos. It's a non-ergonomic operation and repetitive task since the operator has to insert more than 100 grades in the pelletizing car. Today we have a robotic arm that's doing all this job, saving time and improving the operation conditions of the collaborators of the company. Now we have the center of exchange and maintenance of wheel sets in San Luis. Uh, so here we have a robotic cell composed by four robotic manipulators that do uh, automatic exchange of wagon bearings, as you can see here in the picture. So this equipment, they are large, big, they can represent a risk for the operators, and the idea is to use the robotic system to do this automatic exchange of wagon bearings. Now we're going to move for the... Uh, robotic systems operating in labs. So this is a FANUC robot. It's installed in Carajás in the preparation and physical test laboratory in Carajás. And here, this robotic system is doing micro sweeping during particle size trials. Moving to another system, we have the physical sample analysis, analysis laboratory at plant eight in Vitoria. And uh, the system is handling samples during pellet physical tests. Another complex system uh, working in Vali, this is the preparation and chemical test laboratory in Itabira. Uh, the system is really responsible for doing sample preparation for chemical analysis of iron ore. Uh, in this lab, we have four robotic manipulators in a completely autonomous lab, uh, fully integrated. And the, the robotic manipulator is handling samples between different equipments that are doing specific analysis of the mineral sample. Uh, here we have another system, the, the last robotic lab that I'm going to show you is operating in Petrobras. This is the physical laboratory in Vagem Grande. And also we have a robot here that's handling samples during physical tests. So again, we have different equipment. Uh, each one makes a specific kind of analysis of the mineral samples. And the robotic arm is doing a kind of a pick and place activity here, manipulating the samples between these different uh, analysis equipment, as you can see here. So these are, these are the common robotic systems operating at Vali using these industrial manipulators. Now I'm going to talk a, a little bit more about mobile robots operating in Vali. I'm going to talk to you about some research initiatives that are going on at Vali Institute of Technology. So Vali Institute of Technology, also called it ITV, is running research projects and graduates programs. The objectives here are to create options for the future through scientific research and development of technologies 
Also, we plan to expand Valisk knowledge and business frontiers in a sustainable manner. So ITV started a professional master's program in instrumentation, control, and automation of mining process, which is running since 2016. So I'm going to talk about some robots that have been developed uh, in ITV. And first, I'm going to start with Spelio robot, which is one of the most famous robots from Valley. And the idea here is to handle natural caves. So the problem is that the discovery of natural caves in is record, uh, recurrent in areas of mineral exploration. And some scenarios may lead to the exploration impediment. So to explore and do mining in these areas, Valley has to first inspect and map all the caves. This image here is just one example. We have one mining site with several caves inside this area that sh uh, should be inspected before exploration. Uh, in fact, today, Valley has more than 2,000 caves inside mining areas that should be inspected. And natural caves can be a harsh environment to explore. So the collaborators, they have to access these difficult access areas and they, with the risk of founding uh, different problems, including roof collapse, wild and venomous animals, and also the presence of fungi. So to solve and deal with this pro problem, ITV proposed a robotic device called Spelly Robot to inspect and mapping caves and other confined environments. Yeah. So one of the ideas here is to work with an interchangeable locomotion system. So this robot can work using wheels, tracks, legs, or this kind of star type wheels. Uh, it's also carrying different equipment, including a 3D laser, RGB and stereo cameras, uh, one IMU with GPS, motors from Maxo Motors and batteries from Bentronic, uh, from Bentronics, which have a high density energy. And you can see here that this robot is doing a lot of field inspections, inspecting not only caves, but also pipes, galleries, drains, ball mills, and crushers, as you can see in these videos here. Some of the regions that you are inspecting, they have water, so the robot is waterproof. Uh, and you can see here, we can do different kinds of inspections using the robotic system. It's in operation in Valley since 2016. And during this time, you have been done a lot of research related to this robot. So first, we have some researchers related to mobility analysis. So we were, uh, invest, uh, we were analyzing the different locomotion systems and the capabilities regarding transposable height, stability, translational speed, and energy efficiency. And for that, we developed different virtual scenarios where we tested this robot with different locomotion configurations to see which one will be the most adequate one for different kinds of missions. Also thinking about autonomous uh, operations, we are doing a lot of research related to simultaneous localization and mapping, also called it SLAM. Uh, we are dealing with both visual-based SLAM and also LiDAR-based SLAM strategies. So here at the top, we see some results that we got in a mine, an underground mine in Brazil, using the RTAB map, it's a common algorithm. And here at the bottom, we see some results that we got using just laser and IMU. Uh, so here we are testing two uh, algorithms. The first one is Legoloan. The second one was an algorithm that we developed here at the university. It's called AK AKF Load. And both of them are based in the load algorithm that were that was developed in, in Carnegie Mellon by Professor Ji Zhang, which was a colleague of mine during my time at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, so to allow the autonomous operations, we are also focusing on path planning. So we are creating paths, uh, trying to optimize different metrics, including the travel at the distance, the risk of tipping over energy consumption, and also combining these multiple metrics to obtain uh, the best possible path. Today, we are using two main algorithms, which are Dijkstra and RRT star. And here we are applying the path planning strategies in different scenarios. 
This here is a virtual scenario from DARPA Sub Challenge that Carnegie Mellon just participated. Uh, for navigation control, we are using artificial vector fields with obstacle avoidance. So the idea is that given a desired path, we create an artificial vector field. And whenever we have a body or a robot inside this vector field, it's going to suffer two force components, a, ta a tangent one and then a convergent one that's going to make the robot follow the, des the desired path. And as you can see here in the right, we have a video of the robot. This was an autonomous test where the robot was following this desired path with a shape that's similar to eight. This is the Lemini skate curve. And we are placing obstacles in front of the robot. The robot is able to identify these obstacles using laser, and then it's going to contour the obstacles and going back to the desired path, as you can see here. So here are some students of the lab that are annoying the robots during the autonomous operations, as you can see. And the idea was to achieve an autonomous system or at least a semi-autonomous navigation system, as you can see here in this video. So the idea is that we first move the robots around the environment that we want to inspect. Then we construct a map representation based on a 3D point cloud. Inside this 3D point cloud, we select waypoints uh, where the robot should pass through. And then we create a path connecting all these waypoints. And using the navigation control strategy, we can make the robot follow this reference path that we created. And here's a video illustrating all this procedure. Well, now I'm going to move to other initiative uh, that was developed at ITV that are robots for conveyor belt rollers inspection. And here we are using two types of platforms, an aerial platform and a terrestrial platform. So belt conveyors are the most used equipment in the mineral industry for transporting large quantities of material. For you to have an idea, Vale has more than 2,000 conveyor systems with more than 1,000 kilometers of reach, and they have approximately 1.6 million rollers. And as you can see, 40% of failures of equipment in the company are usually related to conveyor systems. And what are the current methods for maintenance? Uh, this maintenance today is done manually. The belt inspections happen periodically in a sensitive way. And the method depends on the inspector experience. And as I said, we are going to, we are trying to use two different platforms, robotic platforms to solve these problems. And I'm going to briefly present both for you. So here we have the air inspection. So what's the idea here? The drone pilot defines a region of interest. Today we have to manually fly the robots near the conveyor belt because Vale does not allow us to uh, fly the drones autonomously. We have the technology, but we, cannot, we are not allowed to use it today. This drone is carrying a thermal camera that capture information and do online processing to detect rollers locations on the image. Then we use machine learning algorithms to classify the roller states. As you can see here in the video, we've, when we found some hot rollers, they are indicated in purple. And finally, we automatically create service orders on value systems, including images, locations, and problem information. And then moving to the terrestrial robots, the idea here is to use a platform that's composed by a mobile platform, a robotic arm, and a set of sensors. Uh, so the, the high payload allows carrying different types of sensors and batteries that can guarantee long periods of operations. Uh, this robot is also able to perform different types of inspections as touching specific parts of the structure and also measuring inside the conveyor belt, which sometimes is not possible to do using drones. As disadvantages, the terrestrial platform is not as fast as the drone, and uh, the motion control can be sometimes more complex than commanding the drones. Uh, talking a little bit about the mobile platform, this mobile platform must overcome obstacles such as rail, road, tracks, uh, stumps and stones, and move index, grill floors, concrete, and metal stairs, as you can see here. 
The platform is driven by side tracks and two pairs of rotation uh, lever arms or flippers, as we call today. In commanding these flippers, we can change the height of the robots with respect to the ground and also the orientation of the robot chassis. Uh, the robotic manipulator, so we use a uh, robotic manipulator with at, si at least six degrees of freedom. Uh, that's responsible for carrying and positioning different types of sensors, which include lasers, thermal cameras, microphones, vibrating sensors, and also an IMU and GPS that is installed in the body of the robot, as you can see here. Uh, also, during the operations, we have to do local map of the conveyor belt, and with this local map, we are able to avoid obstacles. And also, in case of specific inspections, we can touch or access specific parts of this conveyor belt. And this is done using these maps as a reference. So this was the automatic inspection flow that we proposed. So first, we have the robot moving alongside the conveyor belt, the collecting acoustic and thermal data. And if we found something strange or some kind of anomaly, we stop the robots, we do a local map. Based on this local map, we can get, we can collect specific data such as vibration data and do a vibration inspection. And after this local inspection, the robot returns to the regular inspection flow, as you can see here. Well, based on these previous experiences that we got, we developed a uh, a whole new robot that's called Rosie, Rosie, as you can see here. Uh, so Rosie has four independent flippers that we can command independently. So we can change a lot the orientation of these robots with respect to the, to the horizontal plane. The robot is carrying a, a shelf, off the shelf robotic manipulator. This is Kinova Gen 3. It has seven degrees of freedom, and it's carrying different types of sensors, as thermal cameras, lasers, depth cameras. Also, we have six batteries from Bentronix that allow us to operate for more than eight hours. And here you can see some field operations that already have been done with this robot platform. So I'm going to show you some videos. Sorry about that. Jump into it. So this video we show in IRUS uh, now in October in Detroit. Uh, we are presenting the body pose regulation control. So here you can see the robot moving uh, on a roof terrain and we are combining the four independent flippers to keep uh, reference height between robots and grounds. And also we are trying to keep the robot chassis parallel to the horizontal plane. And now I'm going to present you some recent field uh, operations that we did in Side Valley. This is a long conveyor belt that is installed in a restricted area. Nobody can enter in this area when the conveyor belt is in operation. Here we were using both robots, Rosie and also Spider robots. And here we're doing different types of inspections, as you can see. Advance a little bit. So here is the camera that's embedded in the robot. This is the thermal camera that's in the robotic manipulator. And here you can see we can look for specific equipment to check the temperature of each one and see if they are working properly or not. The problem is that when somebody enters in this region, we have to stop the equipment. And we don't have the specific temperature measurements that we need because the equipment is not moving. So that's the, important, the importance of using the robotic systems here for this kind of inspections. I'm going to advance this video a little bit. This is the graphical user interface. We are combining 3D point clouds from the laser and depth cameras. Also, we are combining this with the thermal camera. Here we can see the robot climbing stairs uh, in the operation area. It's a quite dirty environment, so we have to deal with dust, a lot of dust, as you can see here. Uh, we are also able to create a 3D map of the environment that we were inspecting, as you can see here in this part of the video. So we have an idea of the size of the conveyor belt and the area that we were inspecting here. 
this part of the video is going to present you an autonomous operation of the spider robot. So here we programmed it and it's going autonomously from the office to the entrance of the conveyor belt. Yeah. And the idea was to check our algorithms and our, and our autonomous navigation system to see if it was able to work in real conditions in production plants, mining production plants, as you can see. And the robot's going to move into the entrance of the conveyor belt. I'm going to move a little bit further. And as you can see here, uh, we can operate these robots as a team. And now I'm showing you uh, a robot with four legs. This is a Chinese robot that we bought, and we are integrating this in our robotics uh, team, as you can see. And I will talk a little bit about leg robots soon. Well, now uh, presenting you some other research initiatives that are being studied at ITV. So the idea here is to use drones with a high precision magnetometer to do magnetic mapping. So the idea is that we fly this drone in research areas and when we identify some mag magnetic anomalies, as you can see here, this can indicate the presence of magnetic material such as an iron ore uh, composition, or we can also find some uh, magnetic equipment and pieces that have been buried in these areas. As you can see here, that was the case in this experiment here that you can see. What else? We are also studying uh, some specific strategies for to do teleoperation of bulldozers. So here we are checking these virtual reality glasses, also haptic joysticks, different haptic joysticks. So the idea was to give more feedback for the operator. And with this, we realized that the operator can save more energy when commanding the equipment. And also uh, the equipment can suffer less efforts since the operator is feeling these efforts through the haptic joysticks. Also, this is a quite interesting project is the minor qualification in the mining front. The idea is to use hyperspectral cameras to film uh, the mining front and to get a picture like this. So the different colors indicate different types of material. And with this, we can do like precision shovel and excavation. And this uh, hyperspectral camera can be installed in different uh, robots, the terrestrial robots, aero robots, or even in autonomous vehicles that are moving inside the mine. And finally, one of the last slides, this is a famous quadruped robot, it's called Animal. Vale just bought three animals that are operating here in Brazil. So here's a platform that's installed in the, on the top of a tailor dam. The robot is going to inspect some equipments that are there in this platform. And this is a place that we don't like people to be moving on. And here in this video, you can see a, a test that we did just last week in the robotics lab at ITV. And we are learning how to program the robots to do autonomous missions. And here you can see the 3D map, the waypoints that the robot should reach, and uh, the entire procedure of operation, of autonomous operation which is quite similar to the system that we developed here for the Spelio robot. Well, finally, concluding my talk, uh, today I show you different ongoing initiatives regarding the use of robotic devices at Vale. I also describe some novel research projects from Vale Institute of Technology, together with the Federal University of Minas Gerais, with focus on the Spelio robots that was developed developed to inspect confined environments, and also Rosie, uh, we focus on monitoring conveyor belts. And the idea here that I'd like to tell you is that, to show you that service robots deployed in mining activities can increase standardization, reduce personal exposure to risks, improve ergonomic conditions, and increase production efficiency. That was what I had to tell you today. Thanks, Guy, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Gustavo, for the talk. Um, well, we got a couple of questions in the YouTube chat. So I'll, I'll, I'll start reading a couple of them now. We'll see 
how far we can get. Uh, my, <laughs> okay. Um, the first one was about uh, graduate programs in Brazil. So he asked, are the graduate programs in Brazil usually coupled to projects in the industry or is Vale an exception? Uh, yeah, so it's not a rule. We have several graduate programs in Brazil that are not related to industry. Uh, the program that ITV is running, that one is a professional master's program. So that one is closely related to industry. And I, uh, this is a choice of myself. I really like to work side by side with industries. Because for me, it's really important then not just developing technology, but applying this technology in real world problems. So that's why I like so much to work with the Petrobras, the oil company, and also value the mining company in Brazil, because they have a lot of problems to solve and a lot of opportunities uh, for robotics uh, to solve problems and accomplish different kinds of tasks. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, so next one, kind of related to this, is we often hear about the gap between research and industry, and as your research is very application focused, I'm curious about which kind of challenges arise in this field, in field robotics specifically. All right. Yeah. So one of the biggest challenges that we have here is to change the culture of these companies. So whenever we introduce a new robot in these operations have to face some challenge, we have to train people to get used with this equipment. This is also a really important thing. Uh, it's not a question of developing technology, developing new robots. We have to qualify people for them to be able to use these robots by their own. So this should be like kind of simple products for them to use like in a daily routine. And this is something curious. Sometimes also people want to buy equipment that are already developed and they try to use this in Valley or in Petrobras. But sometimes the operation conditions here in Brazil are different. So this equipment, they need modifications. So that's why it's so important to keep trying to develop this equipment here in Brazil, uh, close to the sites that they're going to be employed. Uh, so for example, they developed some uh, autonomous mining trucks in Australia that are usually working in the desert. So when they brought this to Brazil, had to deal with humidity, uh, rain, a lot of rain, uh, mud, mist, that these uh, trucks were not dealing in the desert and had to change a lot of this equipment. So sometimes uh, it's better to try to do some local developments and think about these problems in the beginning of the developments. This is a very interesting point. I had never thought about this. Um, so, so this one is. I think we can go go with this one. You kind of can continue developing this. Is how robust the hardware really has to be to operate in these harsh environments? Yeah, this is a really good question. Uh, so, in mining sites, you have to do with dust. A lot of dust. Uh, when rain comes. Uh, with this dust, we have mug. Uh, also, it, the robots have to be waterproof. They have to be able to work in raining conditions. Uh, so I say that it's a big difference to work in robots inside labs and to go to the field. So I say, I say that working inside labs uh, is much more easy than going to the fields. And to go to the field and develop some robust systems, we have to do a lot of tests. Uh, so it usually takes more time to achieve uh, a final product, which is able to handle these really hard environmental conditions. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. Um, so, um, so, how well does learning-based control, like reinforcement learning, work on practice compared to classical control approaches for these applications? I think it's because we have seen a couple of uh, a couple of research on reinforcement learning for rough terrain navigation. So, yeah, so we have a lot of new uh, strategies regarding machine learning techniques which are great and are presenting some really interesting results, really promising results. Uh, what I can say is that 
people in the mining companies and also in the oil companies, they are quite conservative about the use of robots. So usually they prefer to use well-established methodologies that you can show some proofs of convergence and proofs that, that the, road, the systems are going to work. But it affects today we are starting to work more with reinforcement learning, as you mentioned. And also we use a lot of machine learning techniques to evaluate the data that we are getting to identify anomalies. So today we are using these machine learning techniques more to, proce to process the data that the robots are collecting in fields. But yes, we are studying some reinforcement learning techniques to control these robots. As I said, they are quite promising, showing really interesting results. And the idea, yes, is to use them and integrate with the classical controllers that we are using today. Uh, it, it's something that is going to happen for sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this sounds then probably good to ask this question if you're interested in working on this. Um, so, next question. Good evening, Professor Gustavo. Are these technologies <laughs> are these technologies developed in the research project constantly being applied to the industry, or do they take a long time to actually be applied in production? Uh, this is a great question. So, yes, there is a gap. So, we have technologies that have been already developed and tested in lab that we are not using to apply in the field. So as I said, the drones, autonomous drones, we participate in a drone, autonomous drone race. So we have the technology, but people inside Valley, they don't want us to fly drones autonomously close to the conveyor belt. So uh, there is a gap, and this that was a really interesting question. And to overcome this gap, we have to do a lot of tests have to be really uh, secure about these mechanisms that they're going to work fine in fields uh, before we apply this. And also we have to do a lot of tests, have to qualify people and going like step by step and increase, increasing gradually the automation that's embedded in these equipments before we use them in field. Okay, great. Interesting. Um, so, the one, well, one more question um, is like kind of a more broad question. Uh, what's the role of perception in these systems? And do they also interact with humans or are kept isolated as in manufacturing, I guess, for safety concerns? Okay, so first, uh, regarding uh, sensing, sensing is crucial here can have the best control strategy, but if you are not able to get the, prop, the right localization of the robots, the right, the proper map of the environment, the control strategy is not going to work at all. Uh, so yes, sensing is critical here. And sorry, what was the second point, Leo? Was if these these systems are kept isolated in manufacturing of the oh, yes. interact close uh, with people? Yeah, so today, especially because we are using robots in restricted areas. So today we are using these robots in places that people should not go. So I would say that today they are working separately uh, in Valley. Uh, today we have these new robots, these collaborative robots that work like side by side with people. It's a plan in the future, we're probably going to have uh, this kind of systems operating in Valley. But today, I would say that they are more or less separated. Uh, one example, uh, there was an oil and gas company in Norway that was called Statoil, that today is called Equinor. So they were proposing the use of robotic manipulators in offshore platforms. And they proposed was to separate, to create two areas. One area just with people, and the other area just with robots. So this is one kind of strategy. I would say that it will take some time to use robots side by side with humans uh, in these companies, but probably this is also going to happen. Okay, cool. And uh, one question from me now is for the people who are who are listening and 
might not be familiar with like Brazilian geography, for instance, what, what do you think makes Brazil special to develop research in this this in this field, like mining yes. in particular? Let me try to find the map of Brazil. So Brazil is a huge country and we have different opportunities in different areas. So the, the country is great in producing commodities, uh, oil and gas, uh, iron ore. Sorry, I just jumped in here, uh, the map of Brazil. Uh, also agriculture, we have uh, a lot of new researches regarding agriculture today in Brazil. So we have a lot of options. And also have different regions. So if somebody's interested, uh, thinking about coming to Brazil, uh, I'd like to invite you to come to visit the Federal University of Minas Gerais to try the good food here. And I, as I say, it's similar to US. In each state has its own culture. It's a big uh, country with a lot of interesting cities to, to visit. Okay, great. Um, yeah, we've covered all the questions. So if you have, do you have any final comments? I also would like to thank you for the opportunity to talk here. It's always good to be back at Carnegie Mellon, participating in the projects in the initiative of the company. I have been in Pittsburgh this year, uh, two years ago also. So whenever I have the opportunity and the chance, I go to visit CMU. I would like to say thank you and goodbye to my friends there. <laughs> this is okay, great. Gustavo, we would love to welcome you here and your students as well. This work is amazing. Um, we have so many questions and everything. So I hope this is the start of um, many, many conversations and visits both ways. And thank you, Leo, as well. <laughs> thank yeah, you, Rachel. Thank you. thank you, Gustavo, for making up the time for us and for sharing this awesome work uh, and well as a brazilian i say this very proudly <laughs> yes brazilian <laughs> robots it's nice yes, to be able yes. to present this in a talk at cardigan <laughs> yeah for sure. for sure okay so we will conclude here thanks everyone who joined and have a nice day bye bye all right guys bye bye thank you Okay.